The story takes place in 2022 when I began eighth grade, also known as high school. For those who might mention that eighth grade is typically considered part of middle school, please note that where I live in Canada, we don't have a middle school system. At that time, I was 14 years old, soon to turn 15, and I'm a female. The events began in the middle of the year when I woke up to a loud noise one morning. I peered out of my bedroom window and saw a car parked outside. Inside the car, there were three men who appeared to be in their mid-twenties. Initially, I didn't think much of it. I proceeded with my usual morning routine, heading downstairs for breakfast, and later went back upstairs to gather my things for school. When I glanced out my window again, that same car was still there. It's worth mentioning that I typically wake up at around 5 a.m. to get ready for school by 7.45 a.m. As I stepped out the door, three of my friends were waiting for me and we all chatted while walking to school together. I couldn't help but notice that the car was still trailing us, but I tried to dismiss the uneasy feeling that it was following us. We went through our first and second blocks of classes and then had lunch. A few friends and I decided to go to Tim Hortons for a quick lunch break. Fast forward about two weeks and that same car was still persistently following us to school. My friends and I attempted to walk faster, or even run a bit, but the car continued its pursuit. Then, one day, as we were on our way to school, the car pulled up next to us, and the occupants tried to coax the three of us to get inside. We decided to ignore them and kept walking. Each of us had our phones safely tucked away in our bags, and it seemed like they assumed we didn't have phones. One of them even offered to buy each of us a phone if we'd just get in the car. The story continues with my friends and me using an alleyway as our preferred route to school, since it was the quickest way. We always entered the school premises from the back, which took us about 15 minutes on an average day, and sometimes up to 30 minutes when we were trying to shake off the car that continued to follow us. On that particular day, my friends and I decided to stop at Dairy Queen, and I joined them since I had some money on hand. Dairy Queen was conveniently located just across the street. To our surprise, we saw the same individuals from the car inside Dairy Queen. Initially, we didn't worry too much, since the place was crowded with people from our school, waiting for their orders. However, the individuals from the car locked eyes with us. We acted as if we hadn't noticed and quickly placed our orders, grabbed our food, and left. I decided to confide in my parents about everything that had been happening. They decided that the four of us should walk to school the next day, and they would follow the car to see what they had in mind. The car had always been trying to get our attention but this time was particularly unsettling. When my parents' car was behind them, they recognized it immediately. My parents had their windows slightly rolled down to eavesdrop on their conversation. Much to our dismay, they once again attempted to coax us into their car, this time accompanied by catcalling, which they had never done before. We returned to Dairy Queen for lunch once more, and this time our parents were with us. Three men were there as well, talking loudly about some girls, although we weren't sure which girls they were referring to. We hastily finished our food and left. The following day, the car didn't follow us, and we weren't aware of what my parents had said to them until just last week. My parents informed us that after the other kids had left Dairy Queen, they confronted the individuals and warned them to leave us alone. They threatened to involve the police if they continued to harass us. Now, my friends and I can finally walk to school in peace without constant worry. 
although we still check behind us occasionally to make sure no one is following us. This incident occurred in April 2020 during the lockdown. At that time, I was 17 years old and a female. Meanwhile, in a separate event, I had ordered some clothes online from Amazon since the malls were closed. The delivery was swift, and when I saw the Amazon truck pull up to my house, I eagerly went outside to receive the package. The delivery driver handed me the box, and after expressing my gratitude, he mumbled an apology with food in his mouth, mentioning that he had just started his lunch. This detail becomes significant later in the story. In the following weeks, I didn't think twice about our brief interaction, but something happened that I couldn't ignore, which I'll continue to share. I continue to share my unsettling experience. One day, while on Facebook Messenger, I received a message request from a man who seemed vaguely familiar, but I couldn't quite remember where I knew him from. For the sake of the story, let's refer to him as Tyler. His message began with a friendly hi and mentioned that we had some mutual friends. He even humorously referred to himself as the Amazon driver who had food in his mouth. In his message, he complimented me, calling me beautiful. Curiosity got the better of me, and I clicked on his profile to learn more. I noticed that Tyler was 28 years old, and to my surprise, we didn't actually have any mutual friends. This raised a red flag, making me realize that he must have looked me up using my name from the package I had received. I replied, making it clear that we had no mutual friends and that I was in a relationship, politely stating that I wasn't interested. However, what followed was a barrage of messages from Tyler suggesting that we keep this interaction a secret and making inappropriate propositions. Feeling uncomfortable and alarmed, I decided to block him. But the concern lingered, especially since he knew my address. A few months later, as businesses began to reopen, I found employment at a local coffee shop. On one particularly slow day, while I was organizing some items, the door opened, and to my shock, I saw Tyler standing there. It was as though he had anticipated my presence. I was the only one at the front counter. So reluctantly, I approached to take his order. Tyler greeted me with a smirk and a comment on my appearance, addressing me as beautiful. In an attempt to deter him, I pretended not to recognize him, hoping he would give up. Unfortunately, my hopes were misplaced. After placing his order, I turned away to start working, and he muttered under his breath, just loud enough for me to hear, a disrespectful comment about my appearance. Feeling uncomfortable and vulnerable, I hurriedly prepared his drink and handed it to him. As I reached for his drink, he questioned why I had blocked him earlier and insinuated that he could offer me more than my boyfriend ever could. I firmly declined, saying, no, thank you, have a good day. As he walked out, he ominously mentioned, well, now I know where I can come see you. Following that disturbing encounter, I decided to quit working at the coffee shop and sought employment in a different town, hoping to avoid any further encounters with Tyler. I'll pause here to take a break from the story to thank today's sponsor. Prepare for the new year with Factors ready-to-eat meal delivery solutions. Say goodbye to meal planning stress and set yourself up for success. Skip the grocery stores, meal prep, and cooking fatigue. Instead, enjoy chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered straight to your door. Choose from over 35 meals every week, 
including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie, along with over 55 weekly add-ons. With this array of nutritious and flavorful choices, you'll have everything you need to kickstart your resolutions. No more frantic lunch preps or rushed dinners. Factors two-minute meals are your secret weapon for a quick and delicious meal in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant quality meals, all delivered to your doorstep. Visit factormeals.com comma and use code CANNIBAL50 to enjoy a 50% discount. That's CANNIBAL50 at factormeals.com for 50% off. Now, if you'd like to share your personal story or have any additional text that needs improvement, please provide it and I'll be happy to assist you further. Certainly, I will continue to use English and I'll make sure the text adheres to the guidelines. Here's the next part of your story. This is where the turning point in our friendships came about. I began to realize that Ryan was not just a difficult person, but genuinely a toxic influence in my life. His constant intrusion into my gaming sessions and his inappropriate requests had pushed me to my limits. I decided to distance myself gradually. I stopped responding to his messages, hoping he would take the hint. However, he wasn't one to give up easily. He bombarded me with even more messages, questioning who I was playing with and begging for an invitation to join us. My new group of friends and I had found our groove with Minecraft and Ryan openly detested the game. It seemed pointless to invite him, especially considering his previous behavior. I felt a growing sense of relief as I spent more time with my new friends, away from the toxicity of our past friendship. Eventually, I mustered the courage to have a direct conversation with Ryan. I explained that I had moved on to different games and had found a new circle of friends who shared my interests. I tried to be as gentle as possible, but his response was far from understanding. Ryan reacted with anger and bitterness. He accused me of betraying him and abandoning our friendship. He even resorted to name calling and hurling insults. It was evident that he couldn't accept the fact that I was moving on to a healthier and more positive social circle. The stalking incidents began to escalate and I couldn't ignore the signs any longer. I had always been attentive to even the tiniest details and it became increasingly apparent that something was seriously wrong. I started noticing a black Honda car parking outside my house, not far away, but close enough to make me uneasy. I had never seen this car before in my life. Over time, the black Honda parked closer and closer to my house and I noticed someone inside seemingly fixated on our home. At first, I didn't think much of it, chalking it up to a coincidence. However, as days went by, I consistently saw the same person inside the car. Concerned, I confided in my dad, explaining the situation. My dad decided to investigate, heading outside to check the car. Strangely, as soon as he approached, the car abruptly drove away. My parents didn't think too much of it, believing it was my imagination playing tricks on me. Then, a few days later, an incident occurred that confirmed my fears. I was playing basketball in front of my yard when I spotted the same black Honda again. I made a foolish decision to get a closer look. As I approached my front door, I suddenly saw a man rush out of the car, attempting to grab me. Thankfully, my dad was nearby and witnessed the whole scene. He swiftly emerged with a baseball bat, causing the man to halt and retreat to his car before speeding away. The most chilling revelation came when I noticed the man wore the same shirt that Ryan had worn in the past. I hurried back inside to check my messages and discovered a message from Ryan saying, you're a lucky bastard. 
He had also blocked me. My dad thought it might have been a random individual, but he called the police just in case. Ultimately, they managed to track down the individual. Shockingly, it turned out that this person had been fixated on me for the past two years and had sinister intentions from the very beginning. He had planned to kidnap me. He was apprehended and sent to prison for his actions. Now, at the age of 15, I've undergone significant changes in my life. I've taken up self-defense and become more outgoing. I've distanced myself from the computer, prioritizing my safety and well-being, while I still carry the fear of ever encountering Ryan again. I console myself with the thought that I'll be an adult by the time he's released from prison. I never want to see Ryan or experience such a horrifying situation ever again. I used to go to a 24 7 gym and I'm a creature of habit, disliking change. For context, I'm a Latina girl from Mexico who moved to South Africa just a few years ago. I have an athletic build and have been involved in sports for most of my life. People have often told me that I'm an attractive girl. At the time this happened, I was 16 years old. I have many unsettling stories involving creeps and stalkers, but this particular incident left me with PTSD and I'm still in therapy to heal. Let's begin. At my gym, there was a guy in his late 20s and for this story, we'll call him Tom. Initially, Tom appeared friendly especially towards the girls. When I first joined that gym, Tom was the first person to introduce himself to me. We used to talk, but I always made it clear that I wasn't interested. I never flirted with him or gave any signals. Tom knew my gym routine, and over time, he started becoming increasingly creepy. One day, I couldn't make it to the gym as I had a school assignment that I had forgotten about. When I returned to the gym the following day, Tom approached me and said, Hey, gorgeous, where were you yesterday? I missed you. I was taken aback by this comment and explained that I had a school assignment to complete, so I couldn't come. Tom then smiled oddly and added, Well, you could have let me know. I was worried sick. Up until that point, Tom had flirted with me, but he had never been this upfront about it. I awkwardly laughed it off and headed to the locker room to change. My first exercise was squats, and the leg machines were positioned at the back of the gym. During my second repetition, I felt someone staring at me. Ignoring it at first, I completed the set. When I turned around to grab my water bottle, I saw Tom standing behind me at the leg press machine, just staring. I gave him a polite smile, but he continued to gaze at me. Unsettled, I decided to switch to working on my arms. The strange encounters with Tom at the gym continued to escalate. Every machine I went to, Tom followed, making me increasingly uncomfortable. Frustrated and anxious, I decided to cut my workout short. I entered the locker rooms, which were practically empty since it was a Monday night, and most people had finished by then. I went into a stall to change, but at 9 p.m. it felt eerily deserted. As I was getting dressed, I heard another pair of footsteps entering the locker rooms. The footsteps stopped right in front of my stall, and when I looked down at the gap under the door, I saw two black Nike shoes, the same exact shoes that Tom had been wearing. Tom, I said, confused and alarmed. There was no reply. Fear gripped me as I waited in the stall. Suddenly, the shoes just walked away. I waited a few minutes before cautiously exiting the stall and looking around, but there was no sign of anyone. I quickly gathered all my belongings and left the gym. It was already dark outside, 
and I noticed a blue Ford pickup parked nearby. Tom rolled down the window and asked, Need a ride, cutie? I felt my heart race and responded with a lie. No, thank you. My brother's coming to pick me up. He's only three minutes away. I usually walked home after the gym since I lived just three blocks away, and the cardio was good for my muscles. Tom said, Well, all right. See you tomorrow, giving me a wink. Instead of driving away, however, he pulled into the farthest parking lot. This immediately set off alarm bells in my head. I decided to walk back inside the gym and leave through the second entrance, even though it meant a five minute extension to my walk. I didn't care. I just wanted to put as much distance between myself and Tom as possible. I had always had an unsettling feeling about Tom, but I had previously dismissed it as something in my head. Tom had followed me halfway through my walk home, and I couldn't shake the feeling of dread as I saw the headlights of his blue Ford pickup approaching in the distance. The truck stopped right next to me, and Tom rolled down the windows yet again. Come on, get in. I can't leave you out here, he insisted. I was terrified. How did he know where to find me? Was he waiting for me? And when I didn't show up at the gym, did he come looking for me? Politely, I told him no, explaining that I preferred to walk. That's when he stopped the truck, climbed out, and began walking towards me. Panic set in as I took a few steps back, noticing the anger in his eyes. In a sudden and alarming move, he grabbed my arm, opened the back door of the truck, and threw me inside. It happened so quickly that my brain couldn't process it in time. Tom slammed the back door shut, then climbed into the driver's seat. I screamed at him to let me out, but he ignored my pleas. Desperately, I tried to reach for my phone in my back pocket, but then, I remembered that the battery was dead. My heart sank. Tom started talking, his words sending shivers down my spine. If you had just gotten into the damn car when I told you to, I wouldn't have to hurt you. I love you, and I always have. I've been watching you since the day I first saw you. I've just been waiting for the right time to get you. And now, you're finally mine. We can spend the rest of our lives loving each other. I know you love me. You just don't know it yet. Hearing this deranged man talking like this and realizing the lengths he was willing to go to get me made my blood run cold. I knew I had to play along with his twisted fantasy to have any chance of escaping this nightmare. At that time, my interest in criminology came to my aid. I had been reading books on the minds and behavior of sociopaths, which taught me to stay calm and play along. I played along with Tom's fantasy, telling him I would just like to go home and pack my stuff. I don't have any other clothes with me, so we can't really start a new life yet. Take me home so that I can pack, and then we can run away together, just you and me. I was trying to buy time and praying that he believed my act. Tom looked back at me, his expression hopeful, and asked, wait, really? You'd do that for me? Yes, of course, baby, I replied, maintaining the facade. Just take me home, okay? He nodded, turning the car around in the direction of my house. This terrified me because Tom had never been to my house before at least not that I knew of. We pulled up to my house and I got out, closing the car door and offering him a smile. Inside, I was trembling with fear, but I had to keep my cover. Tom got out of the car and approached me, kissing me on the lips. I wanted to cry to slap him, but I froze up. He then watched as I walked to my front door, which I opened as quickly as I could before locking it behind me. I completely broke down, telling my parents everything. 
my dad was furious. And that very night, we went to the police station. I won't go into the details, as I'm still not 100% ready to talk about this part. When I'm ready, I'll write a... Justice eventually happened. But only after that one night, when that sorry excuse for a human being raped me. He was eventually sentenced to 15 years behind bars. I never could have imagined that one night could lead to a whole year of stalking and terrorizing me. Only for everything to finally be taken seriously when I was raped. Tom, I hope you get the hell that you deserve in jail. To everyone else, please stay safe out there and pay attention to the red flags. Hey everyone, that's about it for today's stories. If you have your own story that you would like to share, you can send it to southerncannibal.com or email it to hi at gmail.com. I look forward to telling your story. Have a good night or a good day, everyone. And remember to always stay vigilant.